This week on Vaticano, we travel to Krakow, Poland to discover the beating heart of the Divine Mercy devotion. Walk the extreme way of the cross with us and visit a new exhibition at Rome's Museum of the Popes dedicated to the Shroud of Turin. For this and more, Vaticano starts now. Father celebrated solemn Mass at the Church of Santo Spirito in Sassia, which in 1994 St. Pope John Paul II officially named the Divine Mercy Church in Rome. In honor of this year's feast, Pope Francis spoke about the sacrament of confession as God's gift of mercy to his people. Like those disciples, we need to allow ourselves to be forgiven. Forgiveness is the Holy Spirit, is the Easter gift to rise internally. We ask for the grace to welcome it, to embrace the sacrament of forgiveness, and to understand that the center of confession is not us with our sins, but God with his mercy. We don't go to confession to beat ourselves up, but to be lifted up. The Feast of Divine Mercy has been strongly promoted by the last three popes. Pope John Paul II canonized St. Faustina Kowalska and established this feast in the year 2000. Pope Benedict XVI beatified Pope John Paul II and Pope Francis canonized him and proclaimed a year of mercy five years ago. In the presence of the icon of divine mercy, Pope Francis called the faithful to live lives of heroic virtue by recognizing our need to forgive and be forgiven. Let us not remain indifferent. Let us not live a half-hearted faith, one that receives but does not give, one that welcomes the gift but does not give itself. We have been forgiven. Let us become merciful. Let us allow ourselves to be resurrected in the peace, forgiveness and wounds of the merciful Jesus. And let us ask for the grace to become witness of mercy. Only in this way will faith come alive and a unified life. Only in this way will we proclaim the gospel of God, which is the gospel of mercy. This gospel of divine mercy began when Jesus appeared to St. Faustina in Poland and Lithuania, directing her to have an image of divine mercy painted teaching her the Divine Mercy Chaplet and asking her to have a feast established in order to make His mercy known. Now the feast reminds us that God's mercy is overabundant and ever-present. All we need to do is ask for it. When Vaticano returns, we head to Poland to discover the beating heart of the Divine Mercy devotion. The Divine Mercy devotion spread worldwide from this small convent in Krakow, Poland. Sister Teresa from the community of the Sisters of Our Lady of Mercy, the congregation that St. Faustina Kowalska was once a part of, 
walks us into the shrine. In 1935, Divine Mercy Sunday, the Jubilee of Redemption, uh, Sister Faustina saw, it was Divine Mercy Sunday, Sister Faustina saw Jesus, uh, like in the image, blessing, and his blessing went out through the whole world. And then she saw a vision of a crystal brightness, like a mansion with three doors. And then no one could come in, it was inaccessible. And then Jesus appeared as in the image and entered into the second, through the second door into the unity within. Jesus asked Faustina to represent divine mercy being poured from his sacred heart in a painting. And he asked for the establishment of a feast of divine mercy on the first Sunday after Easter. This feast emerged from his very depths for the consolation of the world. It's as if this image of that crystal dwelling place is almost like the image of, of a God who, who wants to bring us to his very depths so that in Jesus, through Jesus, we can dwell in God. In 1937, after a vision, St. Faustina predicted that the Feast of Divine Mercy would eventually be celebrated in Rome. She wrote, And I took part in the solemn celebration simultaneously here and in Rome. She saw a large crowd attending the feast and the Holy Father with all the clergy celebrating this feast. And indeed, during the Jubilee year of 2000, St. Pope John Paul II established Divine Mercy Sunday and canonized St. Faustina Kowalska. In her visions, Jesus asked St. Faustina to write an inscription, Jesus, I trust in you, at the bottom of the icon. Jesus is saying, here I am. I'm giving myself completely to you. And what he wants on Divine Mercy Sunday, trust. Trust in him. And this is the worship that he wants. We trust in him. And what is trust? It's eye to eye, heart to heart. St. Pope John Paul II, the great promoter of divine mercy and a heroic example of trusting in God, died in April of 2005 on the vigil of Divine Mercy Sunday. Carson here. We are going to pray in Divine Mercy Chapel today. And every day he goes live on Facebook and prays the Divine Mercy Chaplet. Well, I feel happy. Like, yeah, I feel happy doing it. I, I decided I would do it for everybody that was counting on me. Welcome back to Divine Mercy Chaplet. Um, we are continuing to pray for the end of the coronavirus. Carson was born with epidermolosis bullosa, a rare condition making his skin extremely fragile. Carson, tell me a bit about the condition that you have, the skin condition. I know it's a quite a rare condition. What I'm missing is collagen 7. So just imagine grass rooting into the dirt. Well, I'm missing the roots. So without the roots, the grass just falls right off. Same with my skin. A little bit of friction can cause a whole thing of skin to just rip right off. They call it butterfly skin because it's as fragile as a butterfly's wings. The slightest brush or rub can cause his skin to tear and blister. So how does that affect your life every day, Carson? I mean, just like uh, if I have an itch on my back, which I kind of do, if I itch it, something might happen. Sometimes I can't even swing on the swings because it would give me a blister on my bottom. Like, I can't wrestle with my brothers, which I wish I could do. I mean, sometimes we'll do it, but <laughs> we usually get in trouble for it. Because <laughs> you have to be extra careful. And is it very painful? Because it looks quite painful. It can be sometimes. My worst time is at bath time, because I have to get the dressings, the dressings off, which hurts itself. And then getting them back on can be a process, too. For the sake of the sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of the sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. The blistering means Carson has to constantly wear bandages. But despite the severe pain, Carson is always smiling and continues to pray every day. 
today was kind of a rough day for me. My elbow was sore and I just felt kind of tired. But I'm still doing this, so it's a sacrifice. Okay, let's get started. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And do you think it has helped you in life because you have this rare skin condition and you have difficult days? Do you think it's made easier because of your faith? Yes, definitely. It's, it has made things easier. It can just be overwhelming sometimes, but like, I can pray through hard times in bath or when my feet are bothering me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. People tune in to watch Carson from all over the world. I saw one of the videos, Carson, was watched by something like 60,000 people, just one of them. I know, that that was my um, one day of fame. <laughs> but yeah, I feel happy doing it. I enjoy making everybody happy. Mom says people count on me to get on. Some people even posted like, we're waiting to pray with Carson, the Divine Mercy Chaplet and stuff like that. Good news, it's my birthday. I am officially 13 years old. My mom's holding a sign up in the camera. Very funny. <laughs> keep praying, keep your faith up, and eventually you'll make it to where everything is perfect. Carson just turned 13 and is looking forward to what's ahead. I'm not sure what I want to be when I grow up, but there might be a way to um, earn some money by playing video games by then, I don't know. Thank you for joining me in prayer today, and I will see you guys tomorrow. Bye. In a few moments, we'll be back with more on Vaticano. In Poland, Catholics are taking Holy Week devotions to a new level. It's a tradition called the Extreme Way of the Cross. Father Matthew Tarczynski says that it began in 2009 in Krakow, Poland, and now 100,000 people participate in 20 countries worldwide. It is done alone or in small groups. There is a rule of silence during the extreme way of the cross in order to better reflect on the contemplations that are prepared every year by Father Jacek Strajzek, founder of the extreme way of the cross. Each person prepares his or her own wooden cross to carry during the stations of the cross. You can do at least 40 kilometers, but there are also routes that are more than 100 kilometers. For example, there is a Holy Spirit route in Roklaw that is 144 kilometers. When you suffer pain, tiredness, fatigue, you can also discover your own limits. This is very important in the movement of the extreme way of the cross, to discover one's limits in order to meet God who is an infinite God. The extreme stations of the cross can be done throughout the year. However, there is an official date which is usually the Friday before Palm Sunday. Il venerdì prima della domenica delle delle palme. This year, despite the pandemic, pilgrims gathered at St. Anthony's Church in the Polish city of Jemiany to begin the prayer of the Stations of the Cross in an extreme way. This is Anya's fifth time. 
walking the near marathon length way of the cross. Always at every stations of the cross, I feel great closeness, grace and love, immense love. And every stations of the cross is different. I can never make up my mind as to know what will happen to me next. Every station of the cross is a mystery. For the blessing, equipped with prayer books and wooden crosses, the group heads out for the journey. They stop only to whisper the stations of the cross. Then they continue on their way, piercing the darkness with their flashlights in quiet prayer. Despite the pandemic, the tradition continues. Silence is the rule. Challenging weather is the condition. Listening to the voice of Jesus in the heart is the key. They call it the extreme way of the cross, the extreme answer to God's immense sacrifice for us. In Rome, an exhibition on the Shroud of Turin is about to open to the public. Just a few meters from St. Peter's Square is the Museum of the Popes, a papal treasure chest of over 500 objects, 800 autographed documents, 12,000 books, and 17,000 photographs. The director of the exhibition is Ivan Marsura, and collecting papal objects has been a passion of his from a very young age. I was more or less 15 years old when I was in the seminary in Vittorio Veneto, which was the first diocese of Pope John Paul I. So obviously I was very interested in his life and his papacy. So from there, the passion began, and I started to collect these objects. Ivan tries to collect anything connected with the popes in the hope of preserving the objects in one place. All the material that I'm collecting, I do it free of charge, on my own time. The items themselves, sometimes I have to buy, or many times they are donations from the Vatican. There are many precious items in this small museum, but four years ago, Ivan discovered something that even he couldn't believe. He discovered previously unpublished negative photographic plates from 1898 of the famous Shroud of Turin. For me, I was incredibly emotional, because obviously I was holding in my hand something related to the Shroud, which I consider a genuine relic of the Passion of Christ. So for me, it brought so much emotion. In fact, what's even more amazing is that not only did I find the photographic plates, but also the documentation related to these plates, which showed them to be authentic. That was amazing. The documents state that these pictures were taken by Lieutenant Felice Fino, who at the time was in charge of running the Cathedral of Turin, where the shroud was kept and exposed. The exhibit also displays some relics of the Passion, including a fragment of the Shroud of Turin, a fragment of a thorn and the blood of Christ. And using advanced computer mapping and 3D animation, scientists were able to recreate what they believe was the position Jesus was in when covered by the shroud. And in the center of the museum, they've built a sculpture to match this. Here we can see the rigorous work done by the sculptor Sergio Rodella, who for the first time was able to give shape to the images of the shroud. So if we take the shroud and we wrap it around this body, all the proportions match precisely. And you can see from this how the details on the shroud line up with the sculpture below. This is the first time we see, when the shroud is resting on a sculpture, that the proportions match 100%. Even the blood itself has been completely mapped and reproduced on the sculpture. For Ivan, the work he does energizes him, but it also reaffirms and strengthens his faith. I think that when one finds oneself in front of the mystery, 
contemplating the mystery of the death and resurrection of Christ, and obviously being in front of the shroud, it really creates a strong feeling and emotion within you. For me, the shroud remains a true and proper relic. This Easter weekend, Ivan was making the final touches to his exhibition on the Shroud of Turin that's about to open to the public.